we're coming towards the end of this series. And as I've told people, I didn't get nearly the time that I had, right? And things had come up. Of course, if you watch my channel, you understand that some emergencies came up to where my spouse got injured and I was unable to visit my father in October as a result. So it's a lot of things going on right now. I make no excuses. And if this is not my best presentation, I apologize to you all in advance. Okay. <sighs> what a fitting day to do this Black Friday. So before I get to this, okay, understand that you're going to hear some page turning because I put a lot into these presentations. So if the noise bothers you, I apologize. Okay. So before we get into this, let me start by saying history is never something you can go back and revise. If you are in any way easily offended or triggered, this is probably not the presentation for you. This is not an attack on any race of people, so don't come on my page with your racism, but a look into the start of an industry that, in my opinion, benefited from stereotypes. Remember, what I am presenting is my opinion based on things that have truly happened, okay? These are just theories I've put forth based on observations and historical research that I made concerning uh black men particularly foundational black men or ados black men um, in the united states because mostly those were the black men who were here and asian men in the united states stereotypes concerning black men are prevalent in films throughout the inception of hollywood but started as a continuation of minstrel shows i'll explain more of that in a bit for Asian men, Hollywood had a more complicated history. Old Hollywood had a foreign-born male sex symbol named Sasui Hayakawa. I've been I've already touched up on Sasui somewhat in a previous video. So if you want to go look that one up, please feel free to do. More of this explanation will come a little bit later in the presentation. According to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, minstrel shows started in the state of New York in the 1830s with white performers in blackface. Mind you, they started in the North and not the South. The shows centered around the theme of making fun of plantations. Blackface performances were created to remind the dominant masses that black people were in their condition in the South because of their lack of intelligence, perceived lack of work ethic, and are prone to thieving. This is a few of the stereotypes associated with menstrual shows that came, that carry into the present. Apologize for that. Emancipation is the catalyst that allowed the shows to grow across the country. At the emergence of vaudeville, black men in blackface, such as Caribbean-born actor Burt Williams, also played a minstrel on stage. He was a, one of the few black men who would actually put on blackface because he was so lighter skinned. His companion in these shows was a foundational black American named George Walker, who would uh, pass away at a young age. To those in entertainment, when you have two black men that openly participate in these shows, we can deduce to a degree that it is a co-signing to your own stereotypes and degradation. And it all depends on how you all want to see it. Post-emancipation, the black man is seen as someone to fear, right? Right. It goes from making him look like a coon and a minstrel to also discussing a brutish nature. So what I'm going to do is read you all an article to give you an idea in the late 1800s past emancipation, what people in society thought, for example, of black men. And I got this from the Library of Congress, okay? The article is posted in a paper called The Times on September 10th, 1897, and we entitled the article, The Police Have the Brute. 
A big burly Negro tramp assaulted two white ladies, attacked three policemen, and like an, uh, an enraged wild beast, desperately fought a mob of 15 men and boys who were attempting to capture him in South Washington yesterday afternoon. This is Washington, D.C., not Washington State. Probably, likely where this happened. The victims of the brute are Miss G.T. Sanford, the wife of a grocer at number 12, no, number 21813 and a half street southwest, and Miss Ella Mills Chapel of number 21913 street southwest. About 2.30 o'clock yesterday afternoon, Miss Sanford was standing in the back door of her husband's store when a Negro came up through the alley and asked the price of some watermelons which lay outside the door. Miss Sanford told him, and while she was selecting one for him, the Negro seemed to be looking about the place as if to see if there was anyone outside in the store in sight and even advanced as far as the kitchen door and peered inside. When Miss Sanford asked him for the money before handing him the melon, the Negro refused to take it unless she permitted him to eat it in the shed in the rear and would herself carry it there for him. This she refused to do and the brute demanded where the boss is. Mr. Sanford was not at home at the time, and there was no one in the house with his wife except his two daughters, Miss May, a pretty young girl of 15 and a child of eight years old. And, I mean, as the Negro looked suspicious, Miss Sanford felt afraid of him and thinking to frighten him away, she told him that her husband was upstairs. Use a line, he's done gone away, replied the Negro with an oath. I tells you to come and bring that melon down in the shed. And with that, he made a spring at the woman, who turned and ran into the house shouting for help. When Miss May appeared in response to her mother's calls, the Negro demanded in a surly tone to know where her father was. Just as the brute was about to continue his attack, a young man named Jones, who drives a wagon for Baker Barron, entered the store and the Negro fled, running down the alley. As soon as he learned of the Negro's conduct, Jones took after him, but he had already gone out of sight. He had gone down the alley and entered the backyard of Miss S.F. Leg at number 219 13th Street, which is surrounded by a high board fence, which prevented Miss Jones from seeing him. There he knocked at the back door and asked the colored servant girl for a drink of water. This, mind you, is, the, is what they call the brute still. This procured for him. He demanded something to eat and received a good supply of bread and meat. While the brute was devouring, Miss Chapel's little daughter went out into the backyard where the Negro sat. He immediately asked her to tell her mama to come out as he wanted to see her. The child ran into the house and informed her mother, Miss Chapel, who is Miss Legg's daughter, went to the door to see what he, what was wanted. As soon as she stepped into the yard, the brute seized her with both hands and attempted to drag her back into one corner of the yard. The younger woman fought him desperately and managed to tear herself from his grasp. Her cries attracted the attention of her mother, Miss Legg, who upon learning her daughter's danger, rushed into the street for assistance. There she met young Jones, who was still looking for the culprit, and he hastened in pursuit and was soon joined by a dozen men and boys. Through alleys and over backyard fences, they chased the fugitive into B Street, where the Negro jumped on a passing horse car and attempted to escape. The mob, however, was close at his heels and seizing him violently dragged him from the car and finally succeeded in overpowering him for a time. Park Police Davis, attracted by the excitement of the chase, came up and after a lively fight with the brute during which he was compelled to use his baton, he succeeded in securing him with a pair of handcuffs and telephoned for a patrol wagon. While waiting 
For the arrival of the patrol, the Negro made another desperate attempt to escape, and with the strength of a Samson, he snapped the strong steel handcuffs apart as though they had been nothing more than fragile weeds. While being placed in the wagon, he made another effort to get away and this time packed policeman Rink and Schrader and gave him a tough tussle to subdue him. Several men in the crowd were struck by the Negro in his attempt to escape from them. Upon reaching the station, the Negro first gave his name as John Pine Tree and afterwards changed it to Collins. So afterward, he was entered into the blotter as John Pine Tree alias Collins. He's about 20 years old, a very stout built, weighs 190 pounds, and is very black and has a vicious face. He said that he is a tramp and came here yesterday from Baltimore. Further than that, he would say nothing concerning himself. After he had been locked up, the men in the crowd had been sorry that they had not lynched the brute. Miss Sanford and Miss Chappelle called at the station yesterday afternoon and identified the Negro as their assailant and two charges of assault were um, entered against him. When you listen to that article, okay, it's not hard to catch the innuendos because there was whole songs written in the menstrual period about uh, watermelon being associated with um, menstruacy. And then you have these brutes and being scared. You'll see it later in what's called this movie, The Finality. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It will offend you, but you need to watch it. Over a hundred years ago, this film was previewed at the White House during Woodrow Wilson's administration. This is the turning point in which society tells you that a black man is something that needs to be feared. He is a wild beast that needs to be feared and needs to be tamed and kept in his place. Now, there's an industry producing films that have mass appeal and continue with these harmful stereotypes. This is stuff you see up to the modern day where you go from the brute to the um, pimp in the 70s doing black exploitation to thug pipeline that we're living right now. And mind you, Birth of a Nation was 1915 and we're past 2015. Over 100 years, not a lot has changed. Now. This is where it got worse because this comes a few years after Birth of a Nation. I haven't found much about Stella Mayo, but look at the picture and see where it tells you to draw the line. There's very little of this footage of this remaining, but you can find clips on YouTube. Now, first let's make society scared of black men. Let's make them beast. Let's make them something that deserves to be lynched or deserve to be tamed, just like buck breaking back in slavery. And when that wasn't enough, now that they live free, let's make their women afraid of them because that's what regeneration is. If you watch the clips closely, she being of black heritage saw black men who were trying to steal her fortune as brutes so now the finality and the demasculation of black men has been complete though not a perfect person here Oscar Michaud challenged the stereotypes with mostly black cast in his films though he had of course uh, white actors some have of his films survived to the present, including the film Lion Lips that I have now. In the, it's in the public domain and you can even find Lion Lips on my channel. So if you'd like to watch that, be, feel free to do so. Um, but Oscar Michaud made films to respond to things like Birth of a Nation. Still, we're living these stereotypes. Black men were initially seen as wild beasts that can't be trusted. And now in order to submit that lack of trust, 
film like regeneration got a black women to be afraid of their own men i've already explained okay for this one because we're now talking about asian men i've already discussed the background of Sasui Hayakawa in a previous presentation. So you'll need to go back and watch that. In contrast to their black male counterparts, old Hollywood was um, willing to allow a Asian male to be a sex symbol and a status before anti uh, Japanese propaganda became mainstream. While Hollywood was direct with their stereotype about FBAs, particularly going after FBA men, in my opinion, though you'll see some of that with Sapphires and Jezebels, that'll have to be a video for a whole nother series, whole nother day. This wasn't so obvious at first with Asian actors because they'd already had a sex symbol with uh, him, of course, Sasui. Asian immigration was in increasing especially on the west coast so the hatred was picking up momentum just as Sasui's career was taking off however before Sasui there are already newspapers making comparisons based on skull sizes and this is where blooming box uh racial categories comes in questioning the intelligence of newly arrived arrived Asians in comparison with their white counterparts you all see some of these so if you want to come back watch later pause and read those be my guest and I tell you in the Library of Congress when you look underneath where to find this information the Japanese if you look at the one advertisement are being made out to be tricksters and people that only bring over children to marry they had to sell any stereotype because there was a genuine threat of these new immigrants arriving on particularly the west coast but they were still making their ways inward as well this one is an example of how society truly felt if again, if you all want to pause and come back and read it later, be my guess so that you can go jot this down and verify it in the Library of Congress. The same with the next slide. It's the exact same thing. Okay. Where it changed for Asian males, okay, is a fictional character from the 1960s in the film Breakfast at Tiffany's with Mr. Yunioshi. They got a white actor to play him, which is Mickey Rooney. And that man enacted every possible stereotype and every possible assumption you can make. So for Asian males from this time until the present, Asian men are either this stereotype or must be an overachiever or good at martial arts. By getting a shorter man like Mickey Rooney, they imply that the Asian man is the smaller man who's easier to crush, whereas the black man is the taller man that's the brute that needs to be um, brought down, okay? This is the same time that Sasui would make a small comeback and would stay in Hollywood for a very short time uh, before retiring a few years later in 1966. Also, it is said that Anna Mae Wong, who is of Chinese descent, also challenged the status quo in films in Hollywood, though in her time, she didn't have much success and even played the stereotypes, but we want to mainly stick with the men. Okay, this wasn't a long presentation because for one, I'm not monetized, so YouTube won't let me do most of the time videos over an hour. This is a brief synopsis. See, the primary reason that I did this series was because I'm seeing an increase of women of both races uh, criticizing their own men online 
some of these men being called dusties others being compared saying i can't date you because dating you is like my father and look i before i end i want to say date who you want if you have preferences and those preferences are not your race do your thing i just don't feel you have to put down your own race of men to prove a point but more than anything this is just to let people know and give a small synopsis of where some of these uh stereotypes come from not my best work wish i had broken mr Yoshi down a little bit more but if you've seen the film you understand how that was denigrating to asian american males and how though that carries into the present um just as you see the brute and how you'll see this pipeline in different films from black americans particularly our men or our foundational black american men all right i know this wasn't a uh very robust um presentation and i know you'll all have to go back look at the slides read the slides and research these people but the point is i never want to tell you everything anyway okay uh thank you all for listening maybe one day if i get to a point where i have a thousand something viewers i could go back and revise this I don't plan to monetize, but for now, this is the best I can give you, given that I think YouTube puts time constraints on people who are not monetized. All right. Thank you all so much for listening to this. I know you're enjoying your holiday. You're out shopping and y'all have an uh, excellent evening. Please feel free to critique and comment. And one of these days when I do, when I can get to that a little over a thousand uh subscribers will probably revisit all of these stereotypes but this was just a small touch and go all right thanks have a great uh evening